Welcome to Photo 22's, 2022's headline talk series, Photo Live. It's great to see an in-person audience and welcome to those joining online. I'm Anushka Fazakli, Director of Monash Gallery of Art. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and whose land we meet today, the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. MGA is proud to be partnering with Photo to deliver the Photo Live talk series. Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography is currently taking place in galleries and public spaces across Melbourne and regional Victoria, featuring, featuring 123 artists in 90 exhibitions. The whole festival responds to one thing, being human. Photo Live delves further into the contemporary human condition and addresses the social and cultural role photography plays in our lives across eight events. We will also explore through these talks how art can activate cities and public spaces. And I'm thrilled to introduce our final photo live talk, Photography Festival's Urban Activation. Our chair today is Mary Parker, Director of Communications and Creative Cross Yarra Partnership. And our guest speakers are Varun Gupta, Director of Chennai Photo Biennale, Marie Catherine Blank, Biennale for Actuelle Photographie, Elias Redstone, Artistic Director, Photo 2022, and John Uriarty, Gexo Photo. I'd like to thank our Photo Live partners, ACME, Metro Tunnel Creative Program, as well as our education partners, RMIT, Monash University, and Photography Studies College. We hope you enjoyed the event. And I'll pass over to you now, Mary. And welcome everybody, and welcome everybody who is joining us online. Um, just for a little context, why I am sitting in this chair, uh, from a rail project, which might seem a little odd, is the Metro Tunnel Creative Program has taken advantage of the five kilometres of construction hoardings that we have while we build this uh, five new underground stations and tunnels. And we've used it as a giant art gallery. And uh, we were very pleased to meet Elias very early on in, in the project. And in fact, I think we did about a kilometre of new commissions uh, at mm -hmm. the last festival. Uh, so that's just for a little context, I guess, why, why we're here not talking trains but activation uh, for me today. But without further ado, I really just wanted to uh, introduce, uh, let our guests introduce themselves. Um, and to describe their, how their photo festivals uh, transform the particular cities that, that they are in. So Elias, we will start with, start with you, if you don't mind. Sure. Great. Um, well, thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be sat here with you and uh, my esteemed uh, overseas colleagues. I'm looking forward to hearing from you shortly. Um, so Photo 2022 is the second festival that we are delivering in Melbourne. It's a new biennial, an international festival of photography. Um, and as Anushka um, introduced with, uh, there are 90 exhibitions um, across Melbourne and regional Victoria. And those exhibitions span traditional gallery spaces as well as outdoor public spaces, uh, locations that are not normally used in Melbourne for public art. Um, and I think um, to introduce why we're, uh, what we're doing, it's probably good to explain why we're doing this. So this festival emerged pretty organically based on the incredible photographic and visual arts culture here in Melbourne. Uh, there's incredible um, amount of um, people, institutions, education facilities focused on contemporary photographic practice. Um, historically, the, many of these had operated kind of individually uh, with their own programs. So the idea emerged to bring all these uh, partners together to create something that was much greater than the sum of its parts and shine an international spotlight on Melbourne as a, an important city of photography. 
And while these galleries uh, do an incredible job of programming photography year in, year out, um, uh, it was important to launch this new festival that we actually brought something new to the table. Um, so we wanted to use the city itself as a canvas, as a space for artists to present their work and an opportunity for artists to um, create and exhibit work at an urban scale. So the way it really functions is um, focusing on the dense, um, uh, highly concentrated sort of uh, central Melbourne area that has many uh, galleries and institutions. And we bring art to these public spaces to create a trail of photography across the city. Um, and we do this in many ways. There's a slideshow going on um, behind me where you can see some examples of the way that we activate Melbourne. Um, we <clears throat> have a number of display techniques. We've designed and constructed a series of bespoke structures to present uh, photography. Um, uh, the, the scale of these is often hard to see in documentation, but some of them are two meters tall, three meters tall. We also love working with construction sites. Um, I've always been a big fan of the construction hoarding as a, as a site for art. So we collaborate with um, Metro Tunnel Creative Program um, to um, present incredible photography um, on these you know, often very long um, construction sites. So one of the longest artworks we have in the festival this year is 150 meters. It's by the British uh, photographer Jenny Lewis um, and her documentation of 101 people in, in her community in Hackney in London from the ages of zero and 100. And by working with a construction site, we have this vast area where we can show this almost pretty much life size. So you're walking 150 50 meters and pretty much traveling through time as people are getting older and um, up to the age of 100. Um, we also, um, this year, the images at the moment are sort of light boxes that we've commissioned with the city of Melbourne that are along the Birrarung, also known as the Yarra River, um, on South Bank Promenade. Um, and we wanted to build and construct light boxes to be a space to commission artists to create new work um, that was uh, visible during the day, but also really came alive at night. So place them at a site that's very kind of active um, uh, later in the evening. We also really love um, activating architecture. So this image is uh, by the Ghanaian um, born Sydney-based uh, photographer, uh, Richmond Kobler Dido, and this is the tallest work in the, um, in the festival. It's four stories tall. It stands proudly on uh, Spring Street, which if you're not familiar with Melbourne, it's where all the big political buildings are, the parliament, the old treasury building, etc. Um, and we like to bring people to some of these iconic locations. Uh, this uh, image here is the courtyard um, of the old Melbourne jail, uh, a very historic and problematic site in the city. Uh, we handed over to the First Nations artist, Christian Thompson, to do an epic uh, photographic and sound installation there. And as well as going to some of these really iconic locations, we present works on the steps of the, the Parliament of Victoria, on the steps of the old Treasury building, in some beautiful gardens. We also like to go to some more insalubrious locations down laneways that may appear sort of grotty to outsiders, but are really important public spaces in Melbourne. They're very well used um, and, and loved. Um, so these are just a, a range of the, the techniques that we use to activate cities. Um, and we also like to use um, the humble tour to bring people around, to take people through the city and introduce them to the work. And it's a really powerful way to uh, change people's perception of, of space and place. And um, uh, that's a very brief introduction. I'm sure Thank we'll be you. talking more about this shortly. Thank you, Elias. I just <coughs> would like to note, I think we've seen Varun Gupta come 
Uh, on and look, Varun is the director of the uh, Chennai Photo Biennale. He is actually on holiday in the Himalayas at the moment, and. Um, Kudos to you for going on holiday. I think we're all still a little bit scared of it here, Varun. Uh, but I just want to say, if there are some troubles with accessibility with him dropping in and out, please. please hi, please. hi everyone. Um, um, I'm sorry about that. Very remote place. So Varun, do you mind uh, describing for us the Chennai photo Biennale and, and how it activates uh, the space that it um, takes place in? Yeah, hi everyone. Sorry about the connection issues. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. You know, Chennai is a unique city that it's a large city of 10 million people, which is by the yeah, sea. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Your connection's not great, and I don't think we've got any sound there. Can, can you hear me now? Is this better? We can hear you now. We can. All right. Um, so, yeah, Chennai is, uh, you know, it's an interesting city because it's, it's a city of 10 million people by the sea. It's a traditional sport city, uh, India with its rich history, you know, it, it's quite a mel melting pot of cultures. What makes it really special um, and unique in terms of art is that while it has a huge history of traditional art forms, dance, music and traditional painting, as a contemporary art city, there's not really much. And when I say much, there's two galleries in the city or three. And so, you know, it's, it's been a huge challenge to work with uh, public space because we don't have space for the arts. And so when we started the Chennai Photo Biennale in 2016, our first edition, we took to actually only to train stations. Um, and then from there we began because we have this huge network of abandoned buildings as train stations. And we felt, well, you know, that's a good way to begin because often you have an audience that's not necessarily there for the art, they're on their way to work and you can confront them with art. And that was quite a successful experiment and we've grown since then. So we've taken to places like parks, like beaches, and I'm sorry, I don't have photos to show everyone. Um, like Mary said, I'm traveling, but um, it's it's been an incredible journey where we've been able to experiment with many different formats. And another unique challenge of being in Chennai is that it's not a city with a large contemporary art audience. So every time we have any exhibitions, we start from scratch to create an audience. And one of our most sort of successful experiments has been the use of historical buildings, especially buildings that the city has forgotten in some cases. Uh, in 2019, we were able to open many of these buildings for the first time in 50 years to the public. And we saw people flocking into the venues as much for the buildings as for the art. And I think that's that's a space that we we know that we are working in and it's um while we would love to believe that people come in just for the photographic art i think it's also important that the space itself has its draw and um in 2021 which we've just closed our third edition of course covid played a lot of spoil sport we had our third wave right in the middle of the edition and um we had to make it a lot smaller but what we did was instead of just making it into private spaces, we took to private um, libraries. Um, these are spaces that are frequented by people. And so we converted a lot of these galleries, uh, a lot of these libraries into our exhibition, primary exhibition spaces. And thankfully the second wave died down just in time for us to open one large public show in the museum campus in Chennai. And that, you know, um, it, it's when we say we activate space, I think it's really been, we start from scratch. So on the beach, we quite similar to what Elias showed from the photo 2022, we've had these large hoarding style images placed on the beach, um, confronting the viewer and drawing them to the artwork. Thank you, that's wonderful. John, would you like to talk us through a Gexo, Gexo photo? And yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me today. I'm, I'm pretty happy to, to be here to be able to share uh, my experience working with Gensho Photo. Um, I maybe just have to clarify first that uh, I'm the curator of Gensho Photo. I'm on the, my third year creating the festival. Um, and it's a festival that takes place in Gecho, which is a beautiful town near Bilbao in the north of Spain. Uh, which uses also outdoor installations and uh, like um, non-conventional spaces that we call like, uh, which is basically every space that we can like manage <laughs> to use during the, the festival. Um, we not only organize uh, exhibitions, but also workshops, talks, guided visits, um, many other activities. And uh, it's a festival organized by a small organization 
It's basically a couple uh, who started this festival 16 years ago, and uh, they've been running it through all these uh, years. And uh, with, I would say, quite a lot of success, because one of the things that I felt when I first uh, went there, and I went there first as an artist, and now I'm creating it, but it's the feeling that the people from Gecho is waiting for it. So I guess that as the festival has been there for so many years now, uh, everyone is expecting it. So it has become like part of the uh, uh, like yearly activities of the town. Um, the festival usually uh, shows around 20 to 25 uh, works from local, national and international artists. And uh, it's, uh, Ghetto has its particularities. It used to be a fisherman's town. Uh, it's uh, like uh, 20 minutes from Bilbao, which is a pretty big city. Uh, it keeps like this beautiful fisherman um, neighborhood and also the beaches and some other uh, modern areas. And the festival usually takes place in some of those uh, very iconic spaces where people like usually passes by, but we also try to experiment every year, finding new locations in, in town to uh, also try to, to uh, play a little bit with the spaces and the possibilities of uh, outdoor uh, installations. And um, as I said, it's like a very familiar, a small uh, festival that I think that it has grown uh, quite a lot in the like everyday lives of, of the people from Gecho and also the people around Gecho who, who likes and enjoys. Uh, photography. Thank you. And Marie Catherine. Yes, hello from um, Germany. I'm jumping in from my colleague Yasmin Meinke, our director. I'm the exhibition coordinator of the Biennale für Aktuelle Fotografie um, in Mannheim, Ludwigshafen, and Heidelberg. And I believe you're seeing some slides that uh, Yasmin has prepared in the background. Um, so um, I think you can see currently some of our postcard images and we use some um, questions this, for this year's festival that is also currently running and closing um, on Sunday. Um, and yeah, with those questions we use to activate um, each ex exhibition there in German because mainly our um, audience locally here is German, but we also have a lot of international um, visitors. And um, yeah, it was sort of, um, characteristic for our festival is that um, it's a cooperation between three cities. Um, so um, we have Mannheim, uh, Ludwigshafen and Heidelberg and they're um, very close to each other um, in the metropole region in um, southern Germany. And um, we work together to bring these cities into a dialogue. Um, so we have um, our six partner venues in those cities that are mainly museums and exhibition halls. Um, we work with them every year or almost every, uh, for almost every edition we, we are, um, uh, we happen every two years. Um, and um, I think you can currently see the six exhibition uh, spaces. So two are in Ludwigshafen, three are in Mannheim and one is in Heidelberg. And yes, they're mainly, as I said, yeah, museums and exhibition halls that we use. So they have um, exhibitions on for the whole year and we then um, take over um, some of their spaces for the time of the Biennale. Um, we always invite a guest curator or um, a curatorial team to, um, to create a program for um, every edition of the Biennale. So this, uh, Biennale was um, Iris Sicking from the Netherlands and her theme was um, from where I stand so it looked at sort of different perspectives um, the topics were um, nature technology and um, us and how it's all sort of interconnected um, and it looked at documentary photography as part of um, yeah between art journalism and activism so a lot of the projects were um, yeah were really there to um, make you think about um, what was shown in them and what the artist investigated um, I'm sorry I think I can't really see the slides so I hope that you can now see some of our exhibitions that um, we have um, 
uh, creators. So um, we have um, a couple of exhibitions as a um, sort of uh, overview for you so that you can see um, our spaces that we work with. So um, these are mainly yeah, in the museum space. For example, um, changing ecosystems in Heidelberg Kunstverein in Heidelberg, which looks at biodiversity and um, other projects that um, yeah, look at how our environment changes through um, human interaction. And um, also, um, it's similar to that, the exhibition in the Kunsthalle in, in Mannheim. And then we have one exhibition in um, Port 25, um, which is a bit different, looked at um, sort of how we use the, the internet to connect with each other and how that can also have um, a very positive outcome. Um, yes, but all of these, um, Exhibitions are inside the museum space. But of course, we also always have sort of posters around the cities and the museums often have um, outdoor spaces that we can activate like on their architecture as well or on cladding or things like that. If there is um, construction work, we like to use that too. Um, but this uh, year we also use um, the main stations in Mannheim and Heidelberg. And that's um, a really, um, good way for us to interact with um, our public, because if you travel between those three cities where the festival is happening, you always um, cross these um, train stations. And um, there was one project by Anna Ehrenstein, which we are showing in Mannheim train station. And she um, also, she's very excited about this opportunity. And she likes to think about this as sort of hacking the um, space there, because usually when you are in the train station, you only see the advertisement um, that is hanging there. And um, so that's also, she sort of played with that. And, and we, um, yeah, we try to um, reduce our sort of like educational part of that um, to like QR codes so that you re really can focus on the images. And if you want to know more, you can then, you know, go to a website. We had some educational panels in a different part of the station. Um, so you could, um, yeah, sort of if you walk through the station as um, I think we've just lost Marie. Um, you could um, yeah, just it's over different parts of the stations. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thank you very much for that, Marie Catherine. I oh, think, okay, good. I think we've all probably uh, got together a very good travel itinerary of seeing uh, photography in German train stations, Spanish beaches, and abandoned buildings in India. I think that sounds like a pretty good itinerary to me. Uh, you've all sort of touched on something that I, I would like you to explore a little bit more, and um, selfishly this comes into my work quite a lot, that working in the public space, in the public realm, where people don't have a choice to come up against the art that you're curating. You walk into a gallery space, people have chosen to go in there, um, and so you can perhaps be more provocative or confronting. Uh, you've got a crowd who might be a bit more educated in, in what you're showing and interested in it, but in the, in the public, you know, people are almost accidentally bumping up against the art. So I was just interested to know how, with your, with your festivals, you manage the difference in commissioning um, public art and what you have to think about when you're doing that. Over to you, Elias. Okay, I'm happy to begin. Um, <clears throat> so I think you mentioned commissioning. I think that's something important to, to add, that we actually commission a lot of new work, especially for the festival. And that's either with specific sites in mind or as the artist project develops, we, we consider the most appropriate space in the city. Um, and it's always an interesting challenge. But it is, it's very true. Curating for the public realm has many similarities to um, a more traditional exhibition space, but also many big differences. And you have to take that into account. And that's everything from the fact that you tend to not be dealing with traditional materials. We're not presenting any silver gelatin prints in the Melbourne weather or sunshine, that is for sure. So we're, first of all, dealing with different types of materials, often high-tech materials. I think there's an image of a, a Tonga Thames new commission, Surat, uh, behind me of the Department of Treasury and Finance, and this is a high-tech guess wallpaper in a way that's recyclable, that could go up, that withstands um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, sun and rain, but also does no damage to the building. 
Um, <clears throat> this is one of the con uh, construction hoardings that we that we uh, present to new commission by Tandiri Muru for the specific site in the city. And it's really understanding how people use cities, how they interact with the space just like this, so that you're thinking about the most appropriate work for it. So there's an element of surprise and joy as you go around the city. And also think about work that, that will engage people. And that's not about dumbing down. I think, I think we need to be really clear about that. It's not about uh, simplifying work for the general public. It's just think about what is most appropriate for those spaces. I do have to say, uh, not not just to the photo festival, but quite a few partnerships we have. Not too much negative space because you know we get tagging all the time, and not too much skin, and, and that's just sort of uh, the broad. And within that, you can kind of play around. <laughs> all right, uh, John, is that something that you could talk about? With your face um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that there are big differences um, in between like uh, showing artworks in galleries and in public space uh, and, and being very practical. Usually in public space, uh, you are able to show way less images than in a gallery. You are or like are limited on the number of images that you can show. Uh, you are forced to go to large scale uh, because there's quite a lot of visual noise and not all the works uh, work in large scale. So that's also like a, even if it can be a possibility, it can be also a great limitation. And then what has been already said about the materials that you have to be like weatherproof and also vandalism proofed because uh, if like uh, the artworks can be accessible for everyone, it means that they can be accessible for everyone and even for people who wants to put on some more artwork in, on top of them with graffitis <laughs> or like cutting them or doing all kinds of things on, on them. So that's, those are things to, to think about. But then as, uh, I do think also that it offers some nice opportunities on thinking particularly on like a space where a work can like uh, have a, a really important meaning or like a, a reason to be there, uh, both, I don't know, for historical reasons or like the politics involved on the location and the work. Uh, so I do think that those imitations are also quite playful and can be interesting to, to when creating uh, an artwork. It is true that right now, like there's this trend of uh, like quite complicated narratives in, in, in photography, uh, usually shown on photo books, and those narratives don't work that well on the public space. Uh, so it can be quite challenging trying to build like these complex narratives uh, in which like the photographers have been working in years and years to like relate images between each other uh, when translating them into the public space. So uh, it's fun. I mean, it's 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 a challenge, but it's it's fun also to think on how to show works outdoors. John, I'm actually going to disagree with you for a second, just <laughs> for the sake of argument and Drama. debate. Um, uh, we, we also do a lot of work at large scale, and I absolutely agree with the importance of that and the drama and the beauty and the opportunities that provides both for audiences and artists. But I also believe it's possible to show very intimate work at a small scale. And it's about mm -hmm. thinking about the city and how people engage with it. You know, we can take people down a laneway and provide a much more intimate experience using either a humble rock poster, as they call it here, or a fly poster as they as they would call back in the UK where I'm from um, or a light box that you know that, that, that allows kind of more intimacy um, but I think it's also just as understanding kind of how people move through through the city in the same way that we would think of in a gallery space it's about the kind of like the phenomenological experience uh, but yes I think that the we mustn't forget that small scale is also possible Actually, I sort of I think it's interesting what you're touching on. It's a question I wanted to ask Varun, who has a background in commercial photography. And I think then again we're looking at a different sort of imagery that is in a public space. And I was sort of interested to to get some insights from you about how you think people behave differently to a piece of photography that is very being very carefully placed in the narrative of an advertising context versus the sort of photography that you might put up in the public realm uh, for a photo festival? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mary. I mean, this is quite fascinating because I'm also from an advertising background and I've worked in digital marketing. And I think today people are flooded with 
images and that's the bottom line, whether it's on social media or in public space. And um, you are competing often. And, and I, I see the role of the Chennai Photo Biennale even in the city. So in 2019, we did a lot of our um, exhibitions within trains, uh, metro trains, within the trains as part of signage that yes. traditionally is reserved for advertising. And I think um, the metro, I mean, what it does is people are confronted. So I think what you do is for a second, you confuse them. Um, and I find that's quite exciting that what in, in the mind frame that they're looking at something, they're supposed to see an ad for a bank and suddenly they're seeing an artistic work being presented. Um, and I think that's quite cool that what that does is it, it makes them stop in their tracks. They end up scanning the QR code or writing down the link. And I think that's, that's quite exciting because um, the, it, there is a fine line, but at the same time, if you present the right kind of work that has a commercial feeling to it sometimes, photographically, then you can even interplay a little bit more. And so in 2019, our Biennale was called Fauna of Mirrors. And there was a lot of this performance-based photography that was being presented. And that sort of really worked well in public space, I found. And um, I find that people often stop, look more, and it has a better impact than advertising, which often people have learned to ignore. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, the next question I was hoping Marie Catherine could uh, lead us off on, um, and that is, you know, we, the, the title of the talk is uh, Photography Festival is Urban Activation. And, you know, for the last couple of years, we've been in a period of disactivation in a lot of ways. Um, with Activation usually tends to mean that there are people. It's not just the 2D of the, the photography. It's actually somehow bringing a sense of festivity and engagement and placemaking. Um, but as, as, as a festival that has been running for some years now, how, how do you think that audiences have changed in the way that they respond to the activations that you put on? Well, I think for us it was also yeah quite um, different to la like last uh, Biennale we had to close down because of um, the pandemic. So then we had to think about digitally activating um, our um, our exhibitions and putting them into virtual space. And for this year, for example, we have a lot of sort of hybrid action activation that um, yeah, as I said, if you walk in the train station, you then yeah have your QR code that you can scan and see more of um, the, the project that we're presenting or that links you back to our exhibitions that you may then you know also physically visit and we um, we have um, different tools of sort of um, physical activation and I would call digital activation we have a circle thing called Biennale in a book where you can curate your own exhibition um, digitally it's uh, like an app um, that you can access through our website and then you can you know print it as a book and take it back with you to the exhibition space so that is something that we um, try to do um, for this year's festival but then we also have a lot of workshops and um, other program that activates um, the artworks um, other than yeah talks and, and all of that and we had a very interesting workshop this year as well with um, the Surfrider uh, Foundation, um, um, we did a cleanup because one of the artists and one of our exhibition, um, he was looking at um, yeah trash and how it travels in the world and then the specific um, the specific depot in uh, Nigeria and then um, we invited him and these um, surf riders and we made a cleanup and people came and we actually cleaned parts of the city of Mannheim um, together. So that was a very um, yeah interesting way of activating it and also um, yeah really a different audience that we could then invite to join us and afterwards we invited them to see the exhibition and the artist gave um, Adesa Khan he also gave um, an introduction to his work then was sort of a different perspective coming from just having you know done a cleanup. The next question I want to ask is just sort of the, the model. All of your festivals are a little bit different. And I do, uh, I'm a New, New Zealander by, by birth, and I recall a wonderful story where uh, there's a little town called Wanaka, um, which is 
very beautiful and uh, has very expensive real estate and quite a few affluent people uh, live there and there there was a couple of bright sparks who wanted to start an art festival and they invited uh, 50 people for dinner and they said we want to start an arts festival and they went oh that's wonderful and they said that's great please leave a thousand dollars on the table when you leave and they uh, started with a seed fund fifty thousand dollars from a dinner um, which I thought was just sort of a, a, a clever sort of way but I guess uh, Elias you know you have you started a festival during a pandemic, mm. which is a brave, brave man. <laughs> uh, but you have also, you know, shaped um, you, particularly outdoor activation and new commissions seems to be something that's um, important to that. So is it is it uh, a calculated model that you've taken, um, you know, for, for the Australian Photo Festival? And I guess I'm interested in the model of, mm. of all of the directors here today. And I think it's a great question because there's photography festivals and there's photography festivals that are not indefinitely all alike and everyone has its own charm and and um, uh, um, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to go and see other festivals um, and I'm looking forward to seeing many of the ones um, that we're featuring tonight. Um, so when I um, set up this festival, I wanted to both build on the community that already exists here. This is, it's a very different proposition to some of the festivals we're hearing about this evening, that there is a wealth of incredible galleries and exhibitions, venues dedicated to photography, like the Monash Gallery of Art and the Center for Contemporary Photography. Um, and all the people and culture and uh, image making that kind of swirls around that. So, the way that I established it is each edition would have a central theme and while the festival itself focuses predominantly on the outdoor activations and uh, new commissions, we then invite the art sector to curate their own responses to that theme. So we invite different galleries, um, and when I say galleries, it's the full ecosystem of the art world here in Melbourne. So it's from the largest state institutions down to commercial galleries and some artist-run spaces. Um, and we do that um, partly to celebrate what they do, uh, make sure we're, we're bringing people to uh, to their venues, but also to invite in all the curatorial expertise that already exists. Um, it would feel a bit foolhardy for me to be coming in and be telling everyone what they should be or should not be um, exhibiting, um, but instead have a, a conversation, have a dialogue with these incredible curators and museum directors about how they can um, <clears throat> add to the narrative of the festival. Fabulous. Avarun, would you like to share with us the Chennai photo? Yeah, on? sure. Thank you. You know, our, our model was when we started, it was that there's a void and there's a void that we need to fill. Uh, and the community of photography in India had the Delhi Photo Festival from 2012 to 2015 to look forward to. And then they sort of stopped and there was nothing. And so we sort of... It, it felt like we must. And so we, we stepped in to start. And my background was in public art before I was working for another organization called Art Chennai, which is a festival of contemporary art. And I was a director of photography within that infrastructure. And so it really was that, well, you know, it's time that photography had its own space. Um, like, you know, unlike Melbourne, we don't have the contemporary arts infrastructure in the city. Uh, so we took to public space initially, but also like Photo 2022 or like the Australian Photo Festival, I think what's happened is we did invite and we continue to invite other smaller galleries to add to the narrative and respond to our curatorial uh, each edition. So uh, in 2019, in fact, we had six or seven additional shows curated by each gallery or a separate curator that they've hired to bring in. And th that was also part of our model. And I think the way we're looking to go forward is it has to be a mix. It has to be a mix of what the Chennai Photo to Biennale puts out as its own, you know, uh, artistic content uh, and the curatorial framework, and then allowing other arts organizations to also interplay and participate. And one thing I'll add is, um, you know, something that also references a question you had earlier was what can we put out safely in public space? And in, in India, politically, it's a bit challenging to put out difficult work. And then when I say difficult, anything that doesn't meet the status quo is difficult. And we really have to sort of play a very subtle dance with the government whenever, because all the public venues belong to the government and getting those permissions without telling them exactly what you're showing is not an easy job. Um, 
and often they have questions on the content and we try to defend and we've had times where people have come and complained about shows and we've had to fight back and bring in the lawyers and you know, sort of keep the doors open because the show is political and that's what we believe in as a Biennale and that's what we are interested in showing um, and I, I think that that we have we continue to have to do that and one way that we tackle that and you were asking how has the audience changed to uh, you know the Binali for Actual? I think for us, how have we changed is sort of exciting because I think we have also learned that we need to become more local in our flavor, in our content, in the artists and the artwork. So this edition, we focused on all our commissions to be about local subjects, and I think that was really interesting. So there's a particularly archaeological dig site which is highly contested because it changes the narrative of Indian history. Uh, and we focused all our commissions on this subject, and that was very successful. People came in flocks to see that despite COVID, because we were also talking to them about something that's really personal to the community, uh, and not just the artistic community, but the community at large. Fantastic. John or Marie Catherine, would you like to talk about the models of your festivals? Um, maybe just uh, because it's quite different. I mean, Geto is a town that doesn't like uh, have even 100,000 people. It's, I think it's around 80,000, so it's quite a small town. Uh, so I guess that uh, the model with the other examples is quite uh, different. Also, I do have to say that I was not there when the, the festival started uh, because, again, I'm curating it, not directing it. Um, but I do know that Gato is a town where uh, there's quite a lot of cultural activity. There's a contemporary art um, festival, there's a comic festival. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, cultural activities going on throughout the year. And there's, uh, as it happens in Spain, most of the um, uh, cultural organizations and activities are publicly funded. So it has the support of the city hall, regional uh, government, and also the Spanish ministry. So that's how, how it, it uh, um, is able to, to, to happen. We do have uh, quite a lot of collaborations with other organizations, but not particular, well, small ones from Getxo, but uh, I wouldn't call them uh, arts organizations. They can be restaurants or shops or like uh, this, or like uh, commercial, um, projects and enterprises that are in, in town. And then we do have collaborations with other uh, cultural organizations in Bilbao or San Sebastian and other bigger cities uh, in the area. Um, I guess that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Joaquin and Lucia who started the festival have done very well is like how on to, uh, to communicate the festival. Because uh, I mean, the fact that I'm talking in a talk in Australia uh, from a festival that is, happens in a town of no more than 80,000 people uh, in which we focus quite a lot on uh, on the local audience as well, on like uh, uh, trying to get very close to them. I think it's, it's a sign of success. So uh, maybe just in terms of scale, I thought that it was also interesting to to share uh, the model that has been created in it. John, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't been to the festival yet. I'm actually hoping to come and see your audition. Uh, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> But uh, you mentioned Bilbao and San Sebastian. Bilbao, it's a 15, 20 minute, 20 minute drive away. So it's yeah. very close. Um, and just hearing about the, the Biennale in, in Germany as well, and we also work with regional cities that are two hours, three hours, four hours away from Melbourne. Um, do you, what, to what degree do you have a relationship with Bilbao that is so close or is it seen as very separate? Do you, you, know, you say you do collaborations with San Sebastian that's also up the coastline. Can you just yeah. elaborate a bit on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, with San Sebastian, for instance, there's a, a center of, of uh, contemporary culture, let's say, and uh, we every year have a show there. Uh, that uh, usually an artist that is showing in Getxo is showing also in Tabacalera in that art space. And in Bilbao, we also have had some um, shows uh, installed on galleries or other like uh, uh, venues that uh, are uh, related to us. It is true that in these small towns, uh, going like half an hour away sounds like crazy for like the locals. <laughs> Even <laughs> if like for me who I, I like uh, li I live in London, so I have to like uh, take at least a 14 minutes tube to go to work every day. Uh, I'm very used to those like distances for local people. And again, uh, I think that uh, Getxo Photo focuses quite a lot on local people. That's like a long distance, but still I think that it's quite important to, 
to create those networks with other organizations and to, to try to, to be part of a community that is uh, working uh, towards uh, showing and, and sharing uh, artwork and particularly photography in, in the area. So yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting and I think that this is something that we need to, to, to do and we always try to do. Uh, maybe not so much for the local people of, of, of Getxo, but for the people of the area uh, uh, wider than the town. I wondered whether we might uh, see if the audience had any questions at this time. I can't see. This one oh, great. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Hello. Hi. Hi everyone, I am Nina, and uh, my question is, have you feel censored uh, trying to uh, expose one of the projects? Censored in the way that, uh, censored. yeah, censored. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah, by so me saying no, what, no skin. Yeah, <laughs> what's, yeah, what's the question about censoring, <laughs> sorry? Have you feel? How do we feel about yeah. censoring? No, 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 have you been, sorry? Have, have we been, been censored? Been, yes. Uh, for work that we present? I mean, yes. I'm, I'm willing to kick off, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure the others will say something similar. I think you, when you're dealing with the public realm, uh, you have to just be sensitive to what is socially acceptable um, or, and what is legal to present there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, like some of the other Biennales, we also have to consult with landowners about what images we might be putting on their buildings, especially with dealing with uh, political buildings or people's homes and uh, things like that. So, no, um, here in Melbourne, we haven't been censored yet. I would disagree with Mary. We sometimes like to show lots of skin. <laughs> but it's, it's appropriate skin. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but in a very appropriate way. Um, and then, of course, in inside galleries, you know, the, the rules are slightly different. So I'll jump in there because, I mean, most recently, two things. When 2019, there was an attempt to censor us. Um, there was a work on Kashmir. I, if you're familiar, Kashmir is a very contested piece of land in India. You know, um, it's been fought over for the last 50, 60 years. And there was a political protest. Somebody took objection to the artwork. The artwork was about uh, women's voices from Kashmir talking about husbands and sons who have been disappeared by their military police. And it was a very difficult work. And the work was presented incredibly in this beautiful heritage building. It looked like it was on a Quran uh, and it, it was presented to provoke, let's say. And it did provoke. And we had several people come in. They went to the police. They police came in to shut us down. Um, and fortunately, um, between lawyers and the politicians who were supporting us, we were able to sort of negate that. And all we had to do was eventually put a piece of signage that said, this is a work of art and you must take away what you want from it. And it, it's not meant to you know, provoke. And I think we put that as just a statement. Um, it was a small cop out or a small compromise to make. Uh, going forward, we've been doing that because even in 2021, um, we presented another work on Kashmir, which was again, very political. And in this occasion, we sort of preempted that by putting that statement out there. But I will say that thanks to COVID, we were able to have a very large digital edition in this, in this year. And that digital edition was able to push a lot of boundaries that we were not going to be able to do in public space. And I think that's what was really interesting as a learning from us, for, at least for this edition, was that the digital space sometimes has a lot more anonymity, even though it can be seen and found. Uh, and artists were able to tell their entire narratives, which I know John was saying is often it's tough to put that out in a public realm. And we were able to put out, you know, almost 300 scroll websites in which the artists had imagined the work. Um, and that's how they wanted it out there. And I think all of it was provocative and I'm glad we got away. <laughs> Yes, please. Oh, I've got a loud voice all the time. I'm not yeah. on the microphone, so I feel a little bit. Okay. I find it really interesting hearing from different parts of the world. So thank you. Amazing. And very different spaces indeed. It's very interesting to hear what was said just then 
as in the public coming in and responding and reacting to a piece of work, but then on the other hand, coming in and not allowing for the public to respond to that work and then coming in and putting up a, a, a sign saying, it is, this is art. I'm very interested in this space because I feel that's just as important how a public, a, a member of the public has the right to respond and react. But again, are we shutting them down for having a voice? I think that's why the public domain is very interesting to me. Mm. I, I, I can, just from, from our program's Please, perspective, yeah. an unusual space, um, uh, you know, we, uh, seven years of um, many trucks in the city moving lots of soil around, we're noisy, we're dusty, you can't excavate nine kilometre tunnels 40 metres underground without doing that. We are provoking the city anyway. And so it is very consciously, that, and construction sites by their nature, I love them, I love shipping containers as well, I love that industrial kind of canvas, but they're grey you know, and we are trying to make the city stay welcoming. So it is a very calculated curation of things that are lending towards joyous. And, you know, what's wonderful about that, to be perfectly frank, is we do a lot of work with the LGBTQI plus artistic community who, who just bring that in spades, so many of our artworks. You know, the Huxleys have got me putting neon LED and, and sequins onto construction hoardings, you know. I don't think we're doing that anywhere else in the world. So, so it is a calculated mm. thing to do that for us. It, we're not there to, to be provocative when we already are anyway. But I think it's a delicate thing in the public realm. And, but Elias made a point earlier that you don't have to dumb it down, mm -hmm. the art that you're putting in public. And maybe you want to expand on that. I think there's a difference between making people think and causing offence in, in, the, in the public. And I think being clear that people are looking at art is important. So, Varun, on your point, I, I totally appreciate that, especially for a fledgling young festival like ours. We have to show that people are looking at art. This is an artwork. So even when we take over sites of advertising, we are, we are conscious about that. Maybe in the future we'll... we'll play around with that a bit more and um uh, uh but for the moment i think allowing people to know that what they are looking at is art and to be respectful to that and to be inspired by that and go away thinking about it and not, not everyone's going to love every work we put out there and some of the work that we uh we present is is highly political uh, we don't shy away from topics but i think there's just a few rules that we we follow and that's pretty much sort of no no offensive language, <laughs> nothing that is going to, um, you know, cause direct offence and no full frontal nudity. But apart from that, we're, we're pretty good. Yeah. Is there anything else from the audience? Okay, I think we've got time for one more. I've got, I've got one more question I wouldn't mind just putting to you, which is, what, what do you think the, the vibe shift is going to be for photography festivals? What do you think, you know, in the next 10 years coming out of this, well, it's still a world in taut turmoil in many ways, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but what do you, where do you see the futures of your festivals heading with how they activate uh, the spaces they occur in? Um. So, uh, I mean, as Gato comes in two weeks, uh, and that's why I didn't have the time to prepare the slides. I'm so sorry, but uh, we are quite uh, busy at the moment. Uh, but, uh, and also, I mean, my own experience creating a festival has been during the pandemic. I started three years ago. So I created the first two years of the pandemic, and this is the first one in which, at least in Spain, the uh, situation is quite um, better right now and I can see now like a huge difference already for this year's festival in which we are gonna have some international artists coming uh, which couldn't happen during the last uh, two years and I'm quite excited about that uh, and I can also think of like uh, people <clears throat> from other areas around Getcho also coming to, to, to the festival and uh, I mean I feel like this uh, that we are all eager to meet and to like uh, uh, spend some time 
and occupy some public space, uh, sharing it together around photography, images, and art, and uh, like trying to uh, uh, think through that and share those moments uh, through that. So um, I'm quite optimistic for this year, also because it's so close, and I guess that uh, I'm quite excited about it. And then for the future, I hope that we have learned something from the pandemic in terms, for instance, uh, when talking about uh, festivals and uh, we've like briefly talked about uh, digital uh, uh, extensions of the festivals. I hope that uh, some of that uh, will remain, but not only as like simulations of the, of the physical spaces, but exploring other possibilities that the internet and the network image offers to share um, photography online. Uh, internet is a public space as well. So we should think also on how to how to use that public space um, on our festivals in a way that goes again uh, beyond this idea of simulating the, the physical space. So I mean, it's more of a hope that uh, <laughs> that an actual like thing that I think is going to happen. But uh, let's see. John, I wanted to add to that because I mean, exactly what you said about the internet being a public space. So this edition, 2021, 2022, we spent a lot of time. I felt like I was running two biennials because there was a digital and there was a physical and it was exhausting. And I, I wanted to actually ask the other directors here is, is it worth it? And I, I mean, on my side, <laughs> you know, on, on my side, all, all the hard burden of building a, a digital hybrid edition, which is true to form as its own web platform, which we custom built. I found that while it was amazing to be able to put out that work and to have visitors from all over the world, um, I can count you know, them in the hundreds of the people who actually spent more than 30 minutes on our exhibits. Everybody else came through. You have four minute engagement, and which is actually very large from an advertising background. Four minutes is wonderful for a website, but not so wonderful for a digital exhibition. And what is the value? And I mean, it's a provocative question because we all tout digitalization as the next big thing, but is it? And so, you know, I wanted to put it more out as a question and a reflection. Mary Catherine, do you have a yeah. question on that? Yeah, I can jump in here as well because we also sort of um, looked at those hybrid formats, for example, with our book and we um, will carry that on into our next editions. And I think also with things like these, they often have to first establish themselves as you know, being available and the public um, yeah, becoming more aware of it and using it, getting to know that. And um, that's also one thing that we as a festival want to focus on um, is sustainability because yeah, now we have developed this tool and we want to carry it on to the next editions. But we've also been thinking about uh, things like sustainable production. Mm -hmm. um, for example, for this year, we had a lot of our new productions made in a sustainable way. And that's also something that we really want to think about um, in the next year. We had a series of, of talks about photography and sustainability. It's also something that our um, yeah, artists more and more um, uh, think about. There's one artist um, who made prints specifically on textile because they're easier to wrap and to ship. And um, uh, of course, that was also talking to the theme of her work. But again, um, that is something that I think will really be something that we carry on into the future, um, not only thinking about sort of our um, connections and networks being sustainable, but also the production of the festival more and more. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our, our panel here this evening. I think they've given us some wonderful insights into the complexities and the differences uh, but some common themes there um, about the power of photography and the power of it as a placemaking tool and a peopling tool in different spaces. And uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking everybody on the panel today. And I'm just going to add it, John, a huge thank you. Two weeks out from a festival joining yeah. us. And Marie, Catherine, you, we're both closing our festivals on Sunday, so... Thank you, I really appreciate that. And Varun, thank you so much. Well, thank you all so much for being us, with us this evening. And thank you, Mary, Varun, Marie, Catherine, Elias and John. What an incredible conversation to conclude the Photo Live series with how photography can activate a city. I wanna especially thank Elias and the entire team 
at Photo for delivering a festival of such scale, scope and breadth and allowing our state to be taken over by the most powerful art form of our generation, photography. Thank you all for being with us.